here we have uh, Dr. Yasir Masood and uh, want to ask him as to what does this decade of Belt and Road Initiative mean for developing nations in Africa and Asia? Well, developing for the developing nations, uh, Belt and Road Initiative came as a fresh breather, especially like the continents of Africa and Asia for that matter where most of the development initiatives were actually started off with the geopolitical, geostrategic strings attached with it. So it created a lot of vulnerabilities among the states because for any state under the sun to prosper, the first thing is to have its uh, autonomy, is to have its uh, security and to, to have its uh, sec human security as well. Why Belt and Road Initiative is different from the previous uh, initiatives and why, you know, it is being welcomed by the Africans as well as by the Asians. So first thing is that uh, countries like uh, which are in Africa or in Asia, they always lack, you know, uh, the incentives. They always lack the technology. They always lack the um, uh what is it called, like infrastructure, they always lack uh, expertise. So put together, Belt and Road Initiative, uh, you know, it, it encompasses all these objectives so strongly in itself that it provided to the developing and underdeveloping states. And that is the reason that Belt and Road Initiative, um, you know, it's spanned for a decade now because of its popularity, because of its fair objectives because of its win-win proposition and because of its uh, free, fair and, uh, you know, trade agreements between different countries. That is why different states, even uh, if they are in Africa or even they are in Asia, they did not feel any sort of, you know, compulsions, which are like uh, geopolitical compulsions attached with it. That is why now, we have seen over the years, especially re recently, a couple of years, that uh, quite openly the African countries are now uh, defending the Belt and Road Initiative project itself because it has brought transformation as far as the socio-economic development is concerned. It has brought transformation from the developing states now that it, it has given them a status of a developed states. There are certain examples in the region. So I think the 10 years of uh, Belt and Road Initiative uh, is a is a new era for div different developing states that now they can rely on China, uh, despite the fact that there was a lot of criticism against China. But the matter of fact is that China is a, a realistic partner who really wants to help the its regional partners with true letter and spirit. I think that has made all the difference. What does it mean for China itself, the expansion of its footprint in the Asian and African countries? Well, China need means business because uh, we have seen over the years, even in the history, that China has never colonized any state. China has never invaded any state. China has never come up with any zero-sum tactics or zero-sum games. China has never threatened any other state. So if we see because the, the pillars of Chinese foreign policy are the mutual coexistence, win-win proposition, win-win competition, and to live peacefully and to extend this uh, olive branch to rest of the states, be it uh, uh, immediate neighbors or the extended neighbors for that matter. So for China, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it is playing a very pivotal role for the um, empowerment of China itself. Like the, the vision of the Belt and Road Initiative was actually uh, started off by President Xi Jinping. Local people in, in general in China, they are also very happy with the project itself. And I think it's uh, it means a lot for the Chinese, uh, you know, say, uh, for the Chinese influence globally. So I think it has uh, created more impetus to China's progress in the world.
But this has also caused alarm in the Western world. In the last 10 years, there's been a lot of uh, propaganda, a lot of uh, reaction in the Western world about what China is trying to achieve through the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, they call it debt trap or new form of colonization. So how is China dealing with uh, this sort of campaign? I, it's a very important question. And I think um, before answering this question, it is very important for us to understand the the world we are living in now. We are living in the fifth generation warfare. We are living in the world of war of narratives where you know, where narratives are being constructed and deconstructed at the same time. And this is altogether, it is called the media hybrid warfare, where, you know, a country is being, uh, you know, jeopardized, a country is being defamed and is being debunked just on the surface, you know, by the different slogans like coins, like the uh, debt trap, because we know that different countries have come up with this kind of coins like uh, they coined the, these terms of a debt trap or colonization of China. But uh, the reality is the completely the other way around. So also even in, in Pakistan, in my country, we know China through the Western lens, unfortunately. And that is why we do not comprehend the reality of, of China itself. So before, uh, you know, putting fingers on a project like Belt and Road Initiative, let me tell you that what it has given to the world. There is about 80% of the uh, developing world's debt is being paid by the uh, Belt and Road Initiative fundings to which they are receiving from different banks of the Belt and Road Initiative under this project. So I think it is just, uh, you know, it, it is a media hybrid warfare, which is uh, you know, whatever China comes up with as far as development is concerned or any other, you know, positive aspect of China are concerned. There are certain countries which are perpetually, you know, defaming uh, China for that matter. Also, in terms of economy, uh, you know, it's a protectionist approach through which they are putting more hurdles against the Chinese progress. They are, uh, <clears throat> you know, creating problems. Let's, for example, in the South China Sea, for that matter, they're decoupling different neighbors, which uh, have very good trade relations with China. So any approach which is based on exclusivity, which is based on uh, protectionist approach, which is based on defaming and decoupling a country would definitely harm the global economic structure, uh, you know, in the bigger picture. And this will create more rifts between different states. So this kind of narratives will not do any good to any country. Rather, it will create more, you know, uh, zero sum kind of approach will be emanating from different countries. But the world needs more peace. The world needs more kind of cooperation uh, and coordination. And we are living in the world of multipolar world order where China and Russia are basically, you know, they are the center of, of the multipolar world order. Gone are the days of unipolarity and bipolarity. So in multipolar world order, different states expect to be treated fairly and respectfully. Would you say that uh, the Ukraine conflict uh, has also basically further deepened the divisions that has existed between the Western world and China? And the Western countries are using basically the Ukraine conflict and the China's position also to 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 discredit initiatives such as BRI or CPAC in Pakistan. Yes, absolutely, because uh, we know that the whole economic structure is dwindling because of the uh, setbacks of the COVID-19 and then Ukraine war. But having said this, instead of creating an environment where different states uh, can cooperate with each other, now if this kind of approach, which is uh, coming especially from the West to, to further debunk or defame or discredit China on every front, 
will uh, exacerbate the Cold War, which is existing between China and United States. But but if you see, China has been, uh, you know, has always been coming up with its soft power tools, you know, has been coming up with uh, cooperation and coordination and dialogue. But it's the United States, for that matter, which is adamant and creating more rifts between uh, United States uh, and China itself. But the problem is that it will have its horrendous implications on the entire global economic structure, because uh, let's not forget that China has such an instrumental role, which is actually upholding the uh, the basic tenets of the economic structure of different countries for that matter, which comes under the ambit of the Belt and Road Initiative. Let me give you an example of the CPAC for that matter. We see that CPAC is a game changer and that can change the destiny of Pakistan's economic structure, the destiny of our coming future generations. The only thing is that we really have to work uh, hard, you know, in close uh, alliance with China to, to further strengthen or bolster the relations between both of them. But let me tell you that uh, let's see this perspective in a bigger picture. Uh, even if we see beyond the Belt and Road Initiative, now the other initiative like Global Development Initiative, which hailed by President Xi Jinping, in which we see that it has much more fair and balanced approach, which is now coming from China. The China's role in ASEAN countries, the China's role in the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the China's role in G7 countries, the China's role in BRICS. So we see that China has such a powerful and fair, uh, you know, uh, influence, global influence now, and through which more countries are now attracting towards China. We have seen the trends of de-dollarization, where states are now ready to, you know, take the burden off of this uh, debt from the international financial institutions. And then now they can trade in the Chinese currency so that they can, you know, get more, uh, uh, they can get relieved and then they can take the pressure off because they have to pay back in dollars. So I think that um, China has been playing very uh, fairly and it has a very positive global influence now.